Greetings, and welcome to CyberFocus, your source for international business information. I'm Nick Stern, and I'm here today with Professor Rafael Muveni, a professor at Indiana University's School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Professor Muveni, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so you recently uh, published a paper discussing the relationship between international trade and military conflict uh, between nations. I was wondering if you could give our viewers kind of a brief summary of your findings in that paper. Uh, this paper is a statistical work. Um, we uh, collect data on various variables that uh, international relation theory and international political economy theory suggests that may play a role in conflict, such as uh, whether countries are contiguous, uh, how strong is each country, uh, what are the countries of democracies, and these are the control variables. And uh, the key variable of interest for us um, is the flow of trade between the two countries. The issue is very debated in the literature, and uh, theory suggests channels that through which inter uh, more international trade can lead to increase in the likelihood of um, militarized conflict, as well as channels through which a more international trade can lead to a decrease in the likelihood of uh, a conflict. And uh, we find that the relationship changes across goods. Uh, we find that uh, when you uh, aggregate all the goods together and work with total trade, the effect uh, washes out completely. Um, so the general expectation that trade will bring peace is not supported in the data. So I, I find that interesting because I think that um, kind of conventional wisdom is that trade is a great deterrent to militarized conflict. For instance, I've, I've read a lot of uh, of articles saying that, oh, United States and China could never be get come into a militarized conflict because they're so dependent on each other for for uh, economic reasons. But you don't think that's the case? Um, it's not necessarily the case. Okay. Um, th the key reason why this is not necessarily the case is um, because the actors, the trade, are not the actors that make the decision um, to have conflict with another country. The actors that trade are economic actors, uh, business people, uh, companies, whereas um, the actors that make the decision to initiate some act of hostility um, at some level, uh, we measure hostility across uh, scale, there could be a lot of hostility, full-scale war, there could be just uh, warnings, uh, uh, there could be show of force, there could be display of force, there uh, could be moving forces to the border, uh, it's not the same actors. So, so the bottom line is that the economic <coughs> actors may have some interests uh, regarding the particular trade flow, not all the economic uh, actors care about all the dyadic, all the bilateral uh, trade flows that exist in the world. They may care about some trade flows, but not about others. And then there is uh, some sort of a coalition that forms um, interest groups. Um, and it dep would depend on their uh, political power in a country to what extent the leader uh, would listen to them and uh, decide to take their input into account. And you've talked about how you've looked at a couple of different types of trades, different types of goods. Is there any particular uh, category of trade that you found has been more likely to deter military conflict? Or is it kind of uh, just uh, a mixed bag, sort of a, every situation is different? Uh, uh, When we do statistical work, um, we want to have a large sample of cases. So we pull together 
all the possible pairs of countries for which we have data over uh, a long period of time. Um, so a particular situation uh, loses its identity in such a large sample. And we can say something only about the average. This is akin to uh, a flying above a forest and making statements about uh, right, right. the color of the forest in this region or whether there's a lot of uh, trees uh, in some area or in some other area there are some clearing and we don't know when we fly above the forest what are the particular problems of each particular tree okay so so we, we don't generate results for a particular set of countries like say the United States or China but rather an average result like from regression models that would apply across the sample so uh, the statistical model uh, hinges on the ability of um, uh, the country that initiates conflict toward uh, its trade partners to gain um, by manipulating the trade prices. Um, so there could be uh, economic gain uh, from conflict. That's the idea. Uh, there could also be economic gain from cooperation. Um, the ability to gain from conflict cooperation uh, depends on the ability of the both the country that initiates the political activity and the country uh, that receives it um, to substitute the trade by other trade flows with other countries. This ability will change uh, across goods and the statistical results that we get in the study suggest that um, increases in the import of um, a country in the areas of agriculture, fish, uh, minerals and chemicals, um, and fuel um, increase the likelihood that the, the importer will um, initiate friendly uh, political uh, relations toward the trade partner. On the other hand, increases um, in um, export of uh, energy by a country as well as uh, export and import of manufactured goods um, with a trade partner uh, increase the likelihood that uh, uh, the exporter would initiate conflict uh, toward uh, the trade partner. In this case, the trade partner would be the importer. Okay. Now, let me just uh, say that the dependent variable in that particular study, here, you know, when we do statistical research, the details matter. So, right, right. Uh, the p dependent variable in this particular study was a conflict of any type, as long as it is militarized. The majority of the uh, meds in any sample is by far non-fatal. War itself is rare, and fatal meds are pretty rare. Right, right. Uh, but some people argue that uh, all of these um, militarized disputes should adhere to the same mm. logic, that if you uh, th that countries do not tend to engage in cheap talk, uh, just uh, making threats without a being ready to, to resort to the use of force should the need arise. So if the United States sends uh, B-2s to fly over the demilitarized zone between South Korea and North Korea, then it signals to North Korea, yeah, we're in business, right? You don't play with such things. It's not like... Uh, when you play poker, and the result could be the most, uh, uh, the worst case scenario is you lose the money. Here, you don't do cheap talk. Right, so, oh, do you, so do you agree with that? You don't think that, that governments ever in, engage in sort of empty posturing? Uh, I don't think so. I think that, I mean, otherwise, okay, of, of course governments may 
uh, try to bluff a little bit, etc. But when it comes to matters of uh, defense and um, national security, there's too much at stake. Right. And uh, you may bluff, and the other side may uh, misinterpret you and say that you are uh, in business, and then uh, a war would start as a result of misunderstanding. In fact, there are people are arguing that many of the wars start in this manner. So we have noticed that less and less of that happens um, uh, after World War II. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, so one other area you've done a lot of work in that I find very interesting is uh, the collapse of historical cultures. I was wondering if in your work uh, in that area, you've seen any lessons that you think uh, are relevant for modern societies? Yeah, th that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, uh, line of research. Um, what we do is we try to identify historical societies that were isolated, that did not have a lot of contact uh, with other societies. And by far, the historical societies were uh, of this type. Right? So the Maya lived in a Devon uh, ecosystem, and uh, the Sumerians uh, did have some contact with uh, places around them, uh, but it was very small contact. Uh, the Anasazi Indians in the southwest United States uh, did have j perhaps a little bit of trade uh, with the Aztecs, but by far they they were depending on their own environment. The particular society that uh, we model and a lot of people model um, is a Polynesian society. Um, we know that some uh, island societies of this type uh, collapsed. Um, one of the most uh, famous cases is Easter Island. Easter Island right, is right. Uh, a thousand miles uh, to the south of the center of Chile. Then, uh, to make a long story short, the population rose and uh, reached a climax around, uh, oh, perhaps, between 1200 to 1400 uh, AD, of say around 10,000 to 20,000 people. And then, uh, and then there was a very quick decline in population when the island was discovered by the Dutch on Easter Sunday in 1721. Uh, what they found was uh, a, an island completely barren from trees. Um, perhaps 2,000 people lived in extreme poverty in some caves. Um, there was conflict between them uh, over uh, the few sources of food that were on the island. Uh, the society did not fish. The society, of course, stopped hunting because there were no trees. Right. Um, in short, uh, if they found the society that was in a situation predicted by a hundred years later, with no connection, because they didn't know about uh, by Robert Malthus, um, a Malthusian trap, where a uh, population grows beyond the capability of the environment to support it. Um, so from here, we go through the say, and there is a connection, of course, and we can talk about it if you want, Easter Island, Earth Island. Now, this uh, collapse of the East Island society was man-made. That's the story that uh, uh, we think it happened. So it sounds like you think uh, kind of the main lesson to be derived from that experience is really uh, taking care of the environment, is that correct? Or the importance of, of stewardship of natural resources? It's the, uh, it's two things. It's. Um, It's the importance of um, thinking about the future 
um, and using an appropriate discount rate. Um, the higher the discount rate, the less you care about the future. And, uh, what we try in my line of research to do is to save the island in simulations. And what we do in, the, in this line of research is we model the island as if it is a modern society. The argument is being made, how come the islanders did what they did? I mean, it's like somebody is sitting on a, on a tree and takes a saw and just cuts the, the particular branch that he sits on and then he falls on the ground. So this, it's like irrational to do. If somebody wants to leave and we think that right. everybody would like to leave, if that's the goal, then it's irrational. So uh, what, they were stupid, they were, they were primitive, they were... So some people argue that um, I don't find it uh, appealing as a line of research uh, to argue that they were stupid because then uh, we will learn out of it nothing. Right? We are not stupid. We are. Uh, we know what's going on. They did not know about nature. They did not understand the that they are. They did not understand the relationship between their actions and what can happen to the form of life and uh, they just uh, got stuck in this uh, stupid competition of building statutes and then who cares and okay it's them it's a very interesting uh, historical anecdote and let's leave it at that I believe there's more here uh, so in our research we try to make them like us so we model them as uh, a society that understands nature, that knows the mathematical equations that uh, uh, govern the relationship between their actions and the productivity of nature to support their life. We model them as a society whereby there is a direct connection between the health of nature and the fertility of the society, so connection between nature and life, and they know it. And then we model them as uh, decision makers that uh, a have a, a forward-looking uh, window in which they take into account the happiness of their children and their grandchild and the, the grandchild then take into account the, the happiness of their own children and so on and so forth. So in the model we give them infinite foresight. Uh, I care about me and I care about my child and my child cares about his child and uh, her child cares about her child so and we take all the welfare of all of the generations into account as we decide how much of nature to extract for our own use now. Right, right. Um, what, we, what comes out of it is that unless the discount rate is very low by today's standards, so you need to go to a discount rate of around half a percent, um, there is no difference in how this uh, nature, human nature system behaves. So one could argue they understood, they knew, they took everything into account, they had foresight, they did not live for the moment, and still they collapsed. They collapsed optimally, right? Uh, that was given their, uh, what they wanted to achieve and their discount rate. Discount rate is a behavioral parameter. You don't model that. That's, uh, people can choose it. Um, now we know that half a percent uh, discount rate is very low right. in today's standards. Uh, so we look at the uh, weighted average cost of capital in uh, WACC in uh, financial markets, um, and that's around uh, I don't know what, four or five percent in real terms. 
Right. And with such a, if you use uh, 45 percent in our simulations, your your collapse is not only assured; it's spectacular. That is, uh, population overshoots very quickly, and then boom. So we call that a boom bust. Um, now, what we do is exactly what they do, right? In in many ways. So they were in competition with one another. We are in one competition. They competed over building statutes. We competed over uh, something else that we all fantasize is important. Uh, some numbers in account in a bank, right? Uh, uh, they consume something that destroys the environment. We consume something that uh, destroys the environment. Um, they understood nature w in the simulation. Yes, okay. uh, we understand nature. We are not going to argue. We don't understand nature. And uh, still, uh, we continue to do what we do. Um, why do we do it? Well, we don't care enough about the future. And as long as we uh, don't care enough about the future, eh, we are going to screw up. Now, this discount rate issue indeed plays a, a key role in the debate on climate change. Um, and we can show, given what we know already about climate change, that unless we use a discount rate of around uh, a half a percent, quarter of a percent, um, the costs of acting now to stop climate change are larger than the benefits. So we don't do it. But it's only because we use a, a, a discount rate that is, uh, is, uh, that is comes from markets. Well, what's markets? Markets is just uh, the way people think about it. So uh, you can say, well, maybe people don't understand. And indeed, most of them don't. So they just live for the moment. So it sounds like that you're decidedly pessimistic about uh, society's future. Is that fair? That's, uh, that's very fair. That's very fair. Um, uh, now, I, I just want to qualify one thing. Uh, there is, there is a uh, a difference in type between the models that we do for a Eastern Island society and Earth, right? Of course we know more, of course we are much more uh, knowledgeable. Um, but the only thing we really have um, as a solution as a, don't worry it's going to be fine is a, a belief that technology would be able to advance and uh, save us in the end that we'll find some way to uh, stop the warming too. so all kinds of fantastic uh, ideas uh, are being made such as, oh, we'll put uh, mirrors and people talk about mirrors in space and they would reflect back some of uh, the sun's uh, uh, radiation. Um, oh, we didn't do it yet. Uh, from where does this belief in technology uh, as the savior come from? Um, only from the past. So we look at the past, look at technology. And we made such big progress and technology saved us. And everything was fine and dandy. And, but that, that's uh, one way to look at what happened. Another way to look at uh, what happened is to say, well, technology indeed increased the standard of living and uh, made us uh, on average uh, richer and our life is better, but at what cost? So when people make this argument about technology, they choose to emphasize the positive effects and they choose to de-emphasize the negative effects. That's one. Uh, so it's not sure that any technological solution that might come up in the next uh, decades uh, will just have good consequences. We don't know. I mean, 
if anything, uh, the historical data suggests that um, these are not panaceas. Everything has a cost, everything has a side effect. The other thing is it's not even clear that, uh, that the fa I mean, I don't see the direct uh, connection between, oh, we were smart in the past, uh, we will be smart in the future. Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's, it's a matter of how you think about uh, risk, right? Right. Um, the third thing is that uh, <laughs> we also have a, a line of research where we take this island and uh, we say, okay, let's give them technology. And then we, we put them in the best of all worlds where technology comes constantly. They don't need to work for it. Has no price. It comes in, enters the production processes um, at no cost. Uh, takes effect immediately. Uh, the technology makes nature more productive. Uh, the growth rate of the forest uh, larger. The carrying capacity, the the size of the uh, f uh, forest or, or the ecological uh, system that uh, the island can carry. Um, grow um, like the whole technology comes like we write like manna from the sky like in the biblical story and uh, the question then becomes whether uh, this process uh, can reverse the collapse in simulations and what happens in the simulation is that um, the answer is not necessarily. Unless the discount rate is uh, not less than uh, half a percent or 0.75 of a percent, what happens with technology is that uh, uh, the, the, the boom becomes even more impressive um, and the collapse becomes more impressive. So that's what. Uh, uh, because p p people think, oh, it's going to be fine in the future. So, yeah, the f uh, knowledge will provide solutions. Oh, let's destroy even more. We don't care. I mean, the, the next generation is going right, to be right. more advanced, and they will solve their own problems. So why should we suffer from, for a generation that is going to be much more advanced and is going to be able to fix uh, their problems? We don't need to care for that. And as a result... Uh, the collapse is not averted. So yes, I am. Uh, I am pessimistic. Absolutely. Professor Ravani, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. If you have any questions or suggestions for future topics, please contact us at ciber at indiana.edu.